Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Masalakai. I am one of the coordinators for the Finance, Law and Economics Working Group of the Young Scholars Initiative. Um, by way of introduction, um, so this is part of the YSI IUC webinar series. Um, I think a number of you are members of YSI, which is um, a very large international uh, research community of young professionals um, who are pursuing new ways, new and critical ways of thinking of the economy. Um, the International University College of Turin um, is an establishment that began in 2006 um, and also produces uh, pre pursues uh, new and critical ways of thinking of law and finance. Um, and so it was almost an inevitable partnership between the two institutions um, who are pursuing, uh, pursuing um, heterodox uh, ways of uh, thinking of the economy. Um, it seems like pursuing seems to be a very difficult word for me today, but anyway. <laughs> um, and so the YSI IEC webinar series began in 2019. Um, and we had a number of uh, professors who were teaching at the IUC presenting lectures. Um, and we didn't have it last year because of the pandemic and we're able to get it started again uh, this year. And it is quite a privilege to be able to welcome Professor Monetary. Uh, so he presented on his book, Dominus Mundi at the 2019 YSI IUC webinar series. Um, and so today we're in for quite a treat to hear his reflections um, on Dominus Mundi in a post pandemic setting. And so very much looking forward to that. And thank you, Professor, for joining us. Um, the webinar will be moderated by Anya Vujovic, and she is one of the master students in comparative law, economics, and finance at the University, International University College of Turin. Um, and so we'll hand over to her now, and she will uh, moderate the rest of the webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Christina, for that introduction. Uh, nice to meet all of you. Some of you are meeting for the first time, some of you are not. Uh, and uh, today we'll be sort of revisiting Professor Monetary's uh, lecture or, or webinar or seminar, I'm sorry, from 2019. And I'm looking for, forward to exploring what was very relevant in 2018 to this very different, but somehow very you know, relevant uh, environment. So before we begin, I would like just to remind everyone about our lecture today. So. Professor Pier Giuseppe Monateri is currently a full professor at the Faculty of Law of the University of Torino. He's also a visiting professor at the Sciences Po in Paris and, uh, and a titular member of the International Academy of Comparative Law in New York, you know, member in Academia delle Scienze in Bologna, Professor uh, Honorary. Professor of the San Marcos University in Lima and the Vice President of the Italian Association of Law and Literature. He is a man of many you know, titles. And in addition to being the full professor at UNITO, he's also the coordinator of the Erasmus programs and he supervises students at, at all levels of study. He, he's also editor in chief of the Comparative Law Review, the Cardoso Electronic Law Bulletin and of Dano e Responsabilità. So his, his professional endeavors and academic include a lot more titles, but I would restrict myself to these. And his book, which we'll be discussing, Dominus Mundi, uh, Political Sublime in the World, Order, was initially published in 2018. Uh, discussed here as, as you heard in 2019 and we'll hear more today. So welcome Professor Monateri, it's good to have you here. Well, thank you. I hope you can hear me pretty well. Uh, hope so. Yes, okay. Yeah. So I will share the screen in order to make uh, a presentation. Okay, share it. Uh, you can see it, uh, yeah. Dominus Mund in the post pandemic world. Yeah. So I will follow your suggestions, in a, uh, and this is the outline I mentioned, in three parts, uh, a, a sketchy idea of my book about uh, the master of the world. And second, how does the new COVID-19 induce a, a sort of global hegemony, a new, a new sort of global hegemony? 
Um, and also, uh, the third point, uh, um, make a, a little bit deeper, clearer, the notion of the state of exception, as it is much used today, and, and big quarrels are indeed around if there is an exception or not, in, if it is rules laid down to, to confront COVID-19 are constitutional or not, and what are the emergency powers of government in this, in this setting. So, first of all, a, a, a sketchy idea, um, just a guest of the book. Well, the book, um, uh, I can illustrate it in just three steps uh, uh, using three images as icons uh, of power, the sovereign power, and especially the global sovereign power. The first is the basement of the Antonin column, column uh, erected in Rome to honor the Emperor Antonin, who self-proclaimed himself the owner, the lord of the world. Well, now you see the iconic device of this basement because it, it is like an emblem, so we have to interpret it, but the male figure on the left with the great obelisk in hands is a representation of the Campus Marci or the field where the Romans assembled in army. So, and the other figure, the female figure on, on the right, uh, is of course uh, the Rome, Rome herself, in the sense of the city of Rome, where the buildings are. So, we have a representation of the city, both in these in her two aspects along the river, uh, on the plain. Um, when there was the, the reunion of, of armed people and, and the dwelling places of the ancient Rome. So it is the city. Then we have this, uh, this great winged genius, this figure with wings, which should be the genius uh, of the Roman people. I mean, the spirit of the Roman people. And above the genius, you, you see the, the two figures of the imperial couple, Antonin and his wife, uh, reaching, reaching a, a more than human status. They are in, in the heaven with the Roman eagles. So it is an apotheosis, a glorification of the emperor as more than human. The so master of the world, surrounded uh, by this iconic device of something emanating from the city. Hmm? So th this is just important, that, that there is a, a, a kind of, of civic institutions and the emanation is this godlike figure of the Lord of the world. Well, second image is um, a representation of Dante encountering the Emperor Justinian in Paradise, which is one of the cantors of the Commedia of Dante. And now you see this representation of the Emperor, which is rather intriguing, as an eagle, the usual Roman eagle, but as a corporate body, a corporate body of souls. You see these faces composing the eagle of the empire. So the emperor is, is a physical person, but also he has a corporate body of the empire, which is anyhow a, a sublime body. I mean, we are in the heavens, we have the blue sky of paradise, and, uh, and, and the eagle is a noble animal composed by, by many, many faces that look at you. Then the third image, uh, the, the dramatic change that is yet to be fully underlined to modernity and that we can perceive in, in the uh, frontispiece of the Leviathan of Hobbes, where you see this a very similar iconic device. I mean, a body composed of bodies, the corporate body of the sovereign. Hmm? And almost the same device of the Antonin column, because we have a representation of the city and emanating from the city, the, the figure of the sovereign. And here again, we have in the frontispiece, uh, the city, you see the dwelling places with the hills, 
And then we have this Leviathan as emanating almost from, 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 from the landscape, you know, from the background. But the fact is that Leviathan, as it is known, it is a monster. It is not an eagle or uh, it is not a representation of winged genius. Leviathan is, is a creeping creature, a monster. So we have a kind of turn that is to be identified in which the figure of the sovereign ceases to be godlike and became something as maybe David like or something monstrous. So I call this a demonological turn afflicting the West, a peculiar exotic West construction. And uh, we, we ended uh, a seminar I held uh, maybe one year and a half ago with, with well, focusing on, on, on the city. Now we focus on the city. We can see that the city is almost void with the exception of policemen in a way. And you see these two figures on the right with our two, two doctors of the black, having the typical mask of the doctors of the black. Here we have the representation. So it's a typical mask. And so in a way, it's like if the city has been devoided as it happened during the, long, the lockdown, devoided, with just armed forces and, and, and doctors, and doctors, and musket figures, you know, in a way. So it was, of course, impossible to forecast when I, when I wrote the book, but in a way, that's something which happened and, and, and became almost normal. I think the one of the most intriguing facts, if you, interesting fact, is that nowadays, the, the, the usual discourse uh, bill, um, made by Agamben and others is becoming irritating to me. So what, what happened is really almost the realization of, of, of biopolitics of Foucault and not a state of exception of Agamben. But most of the people, especially on the left, are now irritated by this discourse. And in a way, this discourse itself is becoming worn out as being a discourse on sublime, on exceptionality. When it becomes normal, it loses its strength almost immediately. That's something uh, that was not really possible to preview. So let's try to, to plunge in, in, into my theory and, and the problems raised, especially theoretical problems. This comes today, I'm not here for practical problems, I'm just for theory. Um, of the demonological turn of the West. We, we should take consciousness of this inner mysterious core of Western political philosophy. Embedded in economic uh, in public institutions, and yet which has been denied, almost denied, because the, the West as the land of reason, uh, of, of science, and uh, of secularization. But uh, it, it is as if we, we, we yet conceive sovereign powers as a mysterious locus of scoundrels, the spectral, the spectral space where the ghost of the deceased. Lord of the world sits yet crowned upon his grave. So that was my theory in 2018, uh, much before everything which happened. And so second point, how does the new COVID-19 impact, impact with, with these considerations on sovereignty? Well, since, since the debate is so hot now, I, I prefer to confront this, this, this problem, this issue, through the glasses of uh, Frankenberg, that you maybe know because he's a professor also uh, at Yuke, 
uh, through the glasses of Frank and bearing his pa the pandemic of authoritarianism on the 10th volume of the Comparative Law Review, with reference to the German experience. So just to distance myself a bit from the current Italian debate. So according to Frankberg, declaring the state of exception, state of disaster or emergency, uh, seemed to be a standard response from France to Russia, Tunisia to South Africa, Japan to the Philippines, Venezuela to Argentina, so a real uh, global response that reveals the global desire to break away from the law rule to executive rules and the preference for decision rather than learning. This is a, a, a citation from Frankenberg. So uh, uh, maybe I, I can just guess what he means by learning, but anyhow, I think it is clear enough. I mean, pref preference for decision rather than learning about the pandemic itself. And uh, uh, to Frankenberg, since the German Chancellor Merkel pursued a rather different strategy based on the semantics of approximation. And I think that this is a good point and an intriguing point in discussing pandemic, this semantics of approximation. That's to say that rather than clearly framing social distancing and staying at home as decrees, ordinances, or administrative acts, with a touch of vagueness, German Chancellor referred to guidelines, instruction for action, and standards. So by avoiding, in, as a matter of fact, a definite name like directives, and stressing that the corona rules are not mere recommendations, so they are not just recommendations, but they are not real directives. Uh, and this is exactly the semantics uh, of approximation. I mean, I'm not calling the thing uh, with its proper classical name, but I'm not suggesting it is just a soft law. No, it is law in a way, but it is not called with a, with, with a classic standard names. So uh, it is, a, to Frankenberg, this uh, uh, current state appears to be a kind of spurious state of emergency, which lets the Minister of Health off the hook, off the hook. And indeed, the German label for what's happening is when the invention of the label of epidemiological situation of national importance. You see the complexity of this definition and how conceptual it is. So in, in, in its wording, it is carefully avoided any reference to exception or emergency. As it is in Italian discussions, because uh, many scholars think that there is not state of exception in our constitution, so that we may not, ref may not refer exactly to exception. And it, become, it is becoming a matter of words. Of course, when, when the theory of state of exception is not concerning words, exception, but the material state of crisis denoted by such expressions. So that this, our situation, our current situation, disrupts the typical state of exception, especially those enumerated in the basic law, in the German basic law, but also in the Italian constitution. And this, Classic categories indeed do not fit, fit in with the pandemic. Certainly we have not to do with the suppression of armed insurgents, nor is it likely that cross-border battles would measure up to a cease of tension or uh, it is not a matter of defense uh, of the basic law. I don't think that we are experiencing a real democratic crisis like 100 years ago. No, it's something, it's something different, I presume. I presume that uh, the doctor's dictatorship is a kind of a, a, a emphasis. I mean, it, it, it's 
beyond beyond what we should really mean. So Frankenberg is using this intriguing label of normalized state of exception. The state of exception has been normalized. And especially now on the basis of an infection paternalism. This paternalism is seriously present. Everything is made for our protection, for our health, and is especially, especially it is surprising from, from the right wing, but they, uh, they were, were so capitalistic and in favor of individual choices, individual uh, preferences are paternalistic almost all over the world. So there is, there is for Frankenberry a paradox, which is that he, it is sovereign now, a, a she would does not declare the state of exception. Because the declaration of state of exception is indeed masked in its own turn by the use of other terms. I hope it is clear. Uh, okay, great. So, so, so indeed, I presume third point that we should plunge a bit further into the deep, almost details. Uh, the vacuum details or the state uh, of exception. Well, the Agamben's definition is, as I said, that exception is not linked to the use of a particular word. It may be uh, in French, uh, uh, state, uh, état d'urgence, or état de siège, very different label. It can be a matter of urgency, of a matter of exception, of emergency. So we have many words to denote this state. In his book on the state of exception, he investigated the increase of powers by governments employed in supposed times of crisis. So it was a very broad definition, and certainly from this standpoint, we are experiencing a state of exception in the sense of a great increase in the powers of government in executive actions. So within the state of emergency, Agamben refers to the state of exception where the constitutional rights can be diminished, superseded, and even rejected. And once again, we are very close to, to such a situation. And especially when most of the people, maybe reasonably uh, or not, but are certainly not concerned about this, this diminishing of constitutional rights, because they are this is a temporary, it is just time framed suspension. But it is exactly what the state of exception has always been. A, a time framed exception to the normal rule. And, and so we have, certainly we have the, the claim of this extension of power by government uh, with, with a pure, the search for a pure executive action for the sake of the Republic of the people of the nation or what you like. Mm -hmm. public, public order, integrity, health, and so forth. Now, I, I, I want to be very, very, very uh, brief now, but, but certainly the genealogy, if you look at the genealogy of sovereignty and, uh, and exception, we may find that from the Middle Ages, the imperator, uh, uh, the emperor as lord of the world uh, has been defined uh, uh, as dominus mundi, Ratione protectionis, for the need to protect and defend the people. So, of course, it is at the heart of sovereignty as it is now, the need to protect and defend. But how we secularized this notion? This is a particular French story. 
Uh, the point is that Roman law included the possibility of a suspension of the law for the, for the health, for the salus republice, the salvation of the state. And that these Roman models exercised a strong influence on, on French revolutionaries, on Robespierre and Napoleon, in creating a sequence, état de siege fictif, état de siege politique. What do I mean? The passage from the actual situation of being assaulted by an enemy to the pure political decision of its occurrence. One fact is France is, is really assaulted by enemies. The other is, well, there are riots, there are misdemeanors, there is a plug, and I politically decide the suspension of the normal law to adopt executive measures. This is a passage because, of course, one thing is that we can verify, we, we can check if the, there is an assault, for instance, from, from, from enemies. And the other is, well, there is someone who has the authority to declare if there is or there is not a state of exception. Let's make an easy example in Italian history, uh, the, the march on Rome of Mussolini. Well, the king decided that the, the, that was no exception, business as usual. Since that was not an exception, then it could confer to the point Mussolini as prime minister, everything was normal. But at the very end also uh, 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 in the recent assault to the Congress, we have had a state of exception for a few hours. I mean, the martial law has not been entered in Viber and there has been after all a transition of power according to the roads. It, it has not been transformed or declared a state of emergency. Differently from 2001, 20 years ago, the Congress passed the act on the state of emergency. So this is a, this is a, a peculiar point, which is anyhow, I, I presume interesting, the fact that one thing was the old état de siege, and the French passage to the état de siege politique. So the pure political decision of the occurrence of the exception. So a pure power decision about the political opportunity of using emergency powers for governmental purposes. And so, and so. What, what I would say as, as a tentative conclusion um, before discussion, If we put together Schmidt and Frankenberg, we, we reach this, this, this paradoxical conclusion. Sovereign is she who does not declare the state of exception. And I may identify maybe just from the scholarly point of view, three different stages, pre-modern, modern, and post-modern. For instance, pre-modern, the use of political theology in relation to exception and sovereignty, for instance, uh, exceptional intervention uh, uh, for, for spiritual crisis, like the spread of sin, and papal intervention, for instance, declaring null and void the election of an emperor. And it was a kind of ontological necessity. Well, modern, modern uh, uh, it was the focus on the political decision as such. So from ontology to, to the political. It's a purely political state of exception. And Napoleon declares the state of exception when it is fit for his political action. And a postmodern, maybe a breakaway, 
maybe once again a denial of this pure political dimension toward science based as it is on uh, scientific protocols, uh, scientific reports, the opinions uh, uh, of experts, but, but, but indeed, but indeed, it may be a move towards uh, uh, once again more absconditus locus of authority. Whereas modernity brought authority on the central stage and political responsibility as the cornerstone of public institutions. Here we have a kind of global protocols and adopted by various governments without even using many times the name of exception. So maybe, and unfortunately I was right in the sense that there is inscribed in the West an exotic and a, a heterodox conception of authority as a hidden mysterious place from which powers emanate. Okay, th th thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for, for the yeah, attention. Thank you, Professor. This was a very uh, interesting to me and very, uh, it, it leads me to a lot of questions. <laughs> but uh, I would like to open the floor for discussion. In the chat, there were no questions. However, uh, does anybody have any arising at the moment? I will give you a few seconds more. Oh, yeah, Satvik? Uh, yes, yeah. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, uh, please excuse me, I didn't attend your earlier uh, presentation, nor did I read your book. Um, are we talking about procedural injustice? Uh, because the way, the way sovereign is, whatever, the king or the pope and later on someone else, and now, are we talking about procedural injustices? Uh, uh, procedural injustices? Yes. You're saying yes. that? Uh, mm -hmm. Please. Well, no, no. Uh, okay, okay. Now, I was trying to, to make a, a, a genealogy of, of the powers of exception. And of course, this genealogy is passing through various stages. And the first was, um, I do not know if I grasped your question, no, so, so if you can maybe reformulate it. Uh, the, it's not only a matter of procedure for me, not at all. I understand that many, many lawyers put, uh, framed the issue in terms of procedure. It is not a matter of procedure, I think. Because even if the parliament voted for the lockdown, I presume that there are things that the Congress cannot do under many constitutions, and especially under Italian constitution. So and I presume that if basic rights are violated, it is not a matter of the first saying that, well, the prime minister decided alone by himself. No, it is not a matter of procedure. It is a matter of substance. As it is a matter of substance, the theory of sovereignty, and especially about prerogatives, I, I mean, those hidden powers which reside in sovereignty and are never explicited in uh, completely, fully, fully laid down. Just to complicate the matter further. Um, the idea of sovereignty has changed over time, if I'm not completely wrong. So if it is changing again, I'm not talking about grammatically changing the constitution override to legitimize any such uh, decorian uh, policy or whatever the mat matter may be. Um, 
can we imagine certain situation that such decorian uh, policies become legitimate and uh, not like monster leviathan kind of situation? Legitimate. In, mm, yes. Yes. Well, yes, but I think that the imagery is important. I mean, I made reference to, to, to this stuff uh, because it, it is, I think, um, highly important in the law to understand what is the underlying imagery supposed by the law itself, since it develops the meaning, it helps develop the meaning. So the fact that uh, European modernity has as a political emblem a monster has been not particularly uh, 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 highlighted for a long time. But now it's becoming more and more evident that there is a kind of malaise within the Western political philosophy. That was my point in 2018, just so before that everything happened. And what happened has been extremely well, unexpected, can I say, but not so much from the standpoint of what we were saying, Agamben and Foucault and others, it is exactly in the line of what the Foucault in this course was about. But the fact is that now, and the, the, the first thing I said at the beginning, uh, it is amazing that now the left is uh, refusing this discourse, is marginalizing this discourse. So it is like if Foucault was good as when he was anti-capitalist, but now that we have so many social leftist governments, we cannot use Foucault and the microphysics of power to criticize the action of these governments. And this is, of course, uh, just, just a Schmittian. It is Schmittian because it's just a matter of friend or fool. Who is the government? It is a leftist government. So please don't cite Foucault. Not against the government. Not against Conte. Not against the second five stars. Well, it is amazing. It is like crazy. It, 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 it is something I cannot tolerate, indeed, in, indeed. But from an intellectual point of view, you see. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have two, two more people that want to ask a question. First, we have Nepetin, who has raised her hand or his. I cannot see the. Image, I'm sorry. And then we have Fabio in the chat. So Nepetin, do you wanna pose your question? Okay. Uh -huh. uh, okay, until, there are a few questions. Until they reply, I, I will read Fabio's question. So Fabio asks, uh, would you see ways mm -hmm. to one, make governments more accountable and to empower the population in the collective decision making and then he followed up his question with and how did countries historically exit from this non-state of emergency mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well sure uh, now the one of the most important features of states of exception is that you can cannot do anything about them. I mean, how can make governments more accountable for real exception? We've seen it. A real exception is unexpected. As such, as such, coming back on March 2020, how could we in that week perceive Please remember the fear spread on the first week. This is something I never experienced before. And now, now I understand much better how people can experience a war or live during the war. Because you do not expect it. I'm pretty sure that in July 1914, people were, were not expecting the First World War and could live in the war because you always think it is going to end. Every moment, the massacre of Verdun, the, the great battles, and you think really that, that in a few months, the war will be over thanks to that battle. And you're gone for years and years. 
So when I, the exception is real, there is nothing I presume we can do. Uh, that, that's the, the real point of Agamben's and Schmidt's theory. That necessitas non habit legem. There, is, there can be no law to cope with the absolute necessity. And so we cannot make much, I, I presume. We can regulate uh, the pandemic, sure, but a, a newer pandemic would be an exception if it will be different from this. Of course, we can normalize this state of exception. Now, there is a possibility of a global pandemic, so we can decide procedures, we can decide in advance the protocols to follow, the rules to follow, and so on. But the newer exception will be, of course, uh, 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 unprovoked. Like the burning of the Reichstag, we could imagine the burning of the Reichstag, but could, we, we could imagine the assault to the Congress. This is something, uh, of course, extraordinary as well. It has been sold in an afternoon just because maybe the Americans are more, more prepared to this kind of situation and use force because, of course, it was the movement of the National Guards. So it was a real uh, use of force. So I think that unfortunately, but mm, we can we can do we cannot do anything. And, and I presume that this is the real, the real issue raised by a gambit and Schmidt. And so, of course, we how can we empower the population in collective decision making? Well, people here could, could, could intervene, uh, absolutely. Well, 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 it is the fact that people um, has been very patient. Unfortunately, unfortunately, law abiding. As I never have seen before, 17, certainly not in the 70s. The collective reaction has been, first of all, fear, and then equations. So I presume that in, in, in the majority of the people would have approved all those measures. And maybe they were good measures. I, I, I'm not here to, to disqualify them or to question them. After all, it is a matter of theory. Maybe, maybe. 90% of the Germans were really in favor uh, of what happened after the burning of the rice. It is a point uh, raised by Toshnit uh, in his theory of the constitution. A constitutional court at the very end is useless because constitutional judges or Supreme Court judges like the United States are always chosen among the, the majority, the mainstream. If you're not in the mainstream, you will never become a constitutional judge. So the mainstream of the population is in favor of a shift towards more executive power, so something like that, then it is almost useless to have a constitutional court. A constitutional court or a Supreme Court in the United States is just maintaining the, the mainstream for a longer time than expected. If judges live long, then what was the mainstream in the 60s can survive in the 70s and so forth. But from the point of view of minorities, or real minorities, or radical minorities, it is almost useless to have these procedural guarantees. I do not know, it is a, a very strong and radical point, but it was the same raised by Togliatti, uh, from, so from the communist side, in relation to the constitutional court in Italy, that it's almost useless, because the real struggle is political, and you should fight it just once, general elections. It is useless to have infinite repetition of the same political struggles with judges appointed by political parties and so forth. So th that's my, my, my answer. And how did countries historically exit from this non-state of emergency? Well, the, the, a strange thing of the state of emergency is that they, they seize as, as they happen. They, they come and go 
uh, uh, at a certain point they, they go. But, but, 20 years of emergency after the Twin Towers are, are enough. I mean, it is such a long time. From 30 to, 33 to 45 are 22 years. So the, the Third Reich lasted for 22 years. It seemed enormous, you know, an immense history. And that is in these 20 years, uh, it is like if the political world became flat from this standpoint. Almost the same situation, the same reasoning. And, 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 and so there is something of this case of exception that can last for very long. But I would not, uh, I would make, not make predictions. I don't think the scholars are fit to make predictions. With, with that, I agree, to be honest. <laughs> We have, uh, yeah, pa Fabio, thanks for your answers. And we have a question from P Peter, who has raised his, his hand, yes? Thanks very much. Uh, and thank you very much for the talk. Um, I just have a quick question about the very last slide and the bottom of the slide, because in, you, you mentioned science and scientific authority in the postmodern stage. If you could explain a little bit why is it playing a spe specific role in that stage rather than in the modern stage? Yes, yes, yes. Um, well, the modern state in this case was, uh, was a reference to 19th century especially. So certainly we had uh, one that theory of static of exception was born, not the, the, the kind of organization of science that we experience today. I mean, universities were just few chairs for few students. There was no these big investments in, in chemistry or uh, other or, 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 or the scientific stuff. Technology was not so developed. So certainly science acquired a different status with the great technological advances uh, of the 20th century. And, and especially from the standpoint of biopolitics, only with the, the, the ciphering of the DNA, which occurred at, at the end of the 20th century, so just 25, 30 years ago. Now, the, if biopolitics is the possibility of politically controlling life, and the fact that life becomes the cornerstone of political action, direct political action. It is only now that we really have this technological scientific complex that can dominate us almost completely. But I'm not against it. I'm not an anti-scientist or I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a believer in flat earth or, or, or I'm not a denier of, of the pandemic. I simply assert that now we have seen how political actors are reproducing in political decisions what is supposed to be thought and built and imagined and designed by the scientific sector, especially in medicine. This is exactly what Foucault had uh, at preview. The fact that the scientific sector department is in, in a way dictating, maybe for the good, maybe for the good, dictating the agenda at the content of political action. Something that never happened during the Napoleonic era or even not, not during the first war, and certainly not during the, the great flow or the, the, the Spaniola, it didn't happen. Now it's happening in a way which is very highly organized. You see, the, the, the international organization, um, the UNO on health, has been really preparing and designing the models and the rules to be adopted by different governments. And they have been. So I, I'm neutral on the point. I'm not saying that it is bad or good. I simply saying that it is current and is more in a higher level, a different level than in, in modernity. 
That's all. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions. So one is from Mariela and one is from Nepetin who wrote it in the ch chat. So I would first go with Nepetin just because they raised their hands earlier. Mariela, is that okay with you? Okay. So Nepetin asks, what are the implications of these executive emergency powers for leadership and democracy? But is sovereignty superseded by global emergency power? And what is the role of science in emergency power? Mm -hmm. I can repeat that if I wasn't very clear. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I start from this one. What are the implications of these executive emergency powers for leadership and democracy? Is a sovereign superseded by global emergency power? These are very two different questions. Well, 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 democracy. Um, in, in, we, we are experiencing, I think, that there are uh, different local solutions to global issues. Because, for instance, in the United States and Italy, the division is on party lines. I mean, it, it has been strictly left right. Trumpists against Democrats. Hmm? Well, it has not happened in the United Kingdom, for instance, and not in the same way in France. Especially in the United Kingdom, the Labour and the left had nothing to say on the executive action of government. And the government took almost all positions before a kind of a negationist position, then uh, an hyperactivism in, in intervening. And then again, it has been in Italy, United States, the division is, uh, has really been left and right, center left, center right, if you prefer. And so this is peculiar indeed. But we cannot generalize. So maybe, maybe uh, it is a, a, a new occurrence of having global framework, a global framework, very similar, and very different national responses within the same framework. So sovereignty and global power, but in, in, in my discourse, uh, I, I'm not opposing sovereignism at the national level to globalism. I was reasoning it in terms of empire, or what is an imperial space? Because an emperor is a sovereign as well as a king, uh, as a monarch. So for, according to me, it is not a clash between being sovereignists against globalists. Just because there can be a global sovereign. And this is the history of the West to try to have a global sovereign. The matter is what is a, na a, a, a national territory and a global sphere. I presume that imperial, imperial is something which has no boundaries. No boundaries. Because the real idea of empire is that the, the, the world is just one with a center, the empire, and the center of the empire, and a periphery, but the periphery is just chaos, are barbarians. I mean, think the classic Chinese and Roman conceptions, they are very close to one another. The world is divided in what uh, the, the civilized world, the Rome and the Romans and the barbarians. The civilized people, Chinese, able to write with beautiful calligraphy, able to use refined concepts, and, and, and the rest, the periphery of chaos. This is the real ideology, the real stop of empire. Even the old world reduced to one single sphere of political action with fringes at the, at the periphery. 
From the standpoint, from the standpoint, not everything which is imperial is wrong or bad. If you think of ecology, ecology is imperial because we need to consider the planet as one thing to save it. We cannot have national responses. We need a global response. And as such, we need to consider the world as an imperial space for political action. So do not confound imperial with imperialism. Imperialism is maybe an improper name given to the expansion of European nation states. The French empire was not really an empire in the Chinese or Roman sense of the word, because it could live together with the British empire, the Russian empire, the Turkish empire. Whereas the Roman emperor could not accept another emperor, the Chinese emperor cannot accept that there is another emperor. It was a fracture in the history of, 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 of the West. So we call them pious, just enlargement of national states. Since I have colonies, I have an empire. But it's different from being real, from the real idea of the empire. Uh, I hope to, 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 to be clear on this point. One thing is the imperial space in Roman or Chinese sense, which is universal. And another thing is just to enlarge your own state possessing colonies, colonizing colonies, which is imperialism. So I think that now we have yet the problem of global powers, global powers, and, and, and we need really much more than before to construct them. But remembering that if we build an, an imper a global power, global authority, we are building an imperial authority. That what exactly is. So we are working for the empire, even maybe a constitutional empire, but anyway, an empire. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question from Mariela. Thank you, Professor Monateri. Uh, your lecture is always fascinating. And I take your insight on the Patriot Act to ask a question that I think that connects a little bit many of the concerns of uh, the questions raised here, which is this space of absence in the Patriotic mm -hmm. Act that we are not seeing replaced here because there was an expectation of this imperialistic approach of the US or um, the representation of the West to have some provisions to state a law that can deal with this emergency, emergency moment. So mm -hmm. that is to say, uh, we have the, for instance, we have the COVID regulation, and you said that France and Germany took different approaches on how to solve in procedural grounds, uh, how to deal with the, the, the solution was the same, but the way that the population felt how France regulated the COVID and how Germany did, is it's different, but in the regulation mm. is the same. Everyone needs to present mm. a COVID pass in order to be able to, um, mm. to enjoy some rights. So in this sense, what do you think taking a Gambian definition of state of exception when law and exception coincide in the moment in which every day the sovereign decides what the, the law will be? How do you see this? absence of a patriot act on these regards, the, the regard of the pandemic. And if you think that this state will last forever, so we are living in the state of exception of the patriot act for 20 years, but we have mm -hmm. something that was enacted by imperialistic power and we don't have that anymore right now. So it's the reason why I see so many concerns and so many people asking if it, this is taking the procedural grounds on the pandemics because they are denying rights. 
but in, in another ground as the final solution, because if we, we, if we think about the, the Nazist regime, uh, the substantial decision of eliminating the Jews was taken by the regime, but the way that was enacted depended on a real long chain of very little manager orders, which coincide sometimes with the Foucault approach. And I totally understand you when you say, we, we need to rebook that as a leftist if you are taking Foucault's approach. And thank you so much again. Mm, mm, mm. Well, there are many things in, 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 your, in your talk. Well, uh, I'm a bit stunned by the, the quarrels about the Green Pass, because I think it is much more a symbol than anything else. Uh, since we have identity cards, I mean, I, I can understand a British subject saying, well, I don't want to have papers with me. This is a classic English position. But we have identity cards, we have sanitary cards. It was easy for the government to, to say that on our sanitary card, which is readable by computers, it is just written if we are vaccinated or not. So the same idea of imposing a different document is in a way I understand disturbing, disturbing, because it was much easier to put it on your sanitary card. But on the other side, I find disturbing the fact of a rebellion against the sanitary pass when we have identity cards. We have all, we have all these papers with us. The police also had the power to ask us, who you are, give me your card. You cannot reserve an hotel in Italy or you cannot sleep in a hotel without showing your identity card. This is of course against natural freedom in Tom Paine's sense. It is an American. It is normal for us. So the fact of having a green pass is, is disturbing for me on both sides. Don't like what the government did I don't like the rebellion against what the government did. And, and it is, a, 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 anyhow, I, I, I'm interested in this symbolic dimension of conflict, of course. And this is exactly a, a, a symbolic struggle. Then, then, then you, you raised other, other, other problems, of course, but I, I don't feel. Yes, I don't feel, but this is not my scholarship engaged now. It is my personal beliefs. I don't feel a danger for democracy. And I would be interested if you feel it or not. I don't feel it. Why? First of all, because democracy has already become thin. Thin. Democracy today is just deciding over the budget of the government and the budget, which is substantial, substantially already decided. We have so many international agreements and engagements that what we have to, to vote for, just for a portion of the budget, that's all. So where is now, where are now the people willing to destroy democracy? Come on, uh, democracy is thin, it's so thin. I'm much concerned about the regulation of private behaviors. That, that's real matter of concern. But certainly pandemic did not do much more than what were, was already going on. I'm much more frightened by the day when my assurance would like to have just to sign the contract, my DNA and all my all the infos of my of my family, and it will happen. And you know, people would say, "Well, am I paying less? I'm paying less. I'm saving fifty dollars. I give my DNA for for that for fifty dollars." So I'm really concerned. But my concern is about the people, not not groups of authoritarian clock and dagger operators. The danger of democracy are within the people now. I mean, people is no more believing it strongly in, 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 the, in the classical values. For us, it, is, it has become normal that our correspondence is read by others, is tapped and so on. Well, it is normal. It was not normal at all. When it was in certain constitution, it was forbidden 
to open the letters of others, those letters was not just greetings to family. They were political letters. They were concocting the revolution. So we, 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 we lost, we lost the sense and dimension of all this. And gradually, smoothly, spontaneously. I hope I, I have coped with your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, did you want to say something, Professor? Okay. Oh, yes, no, because there is a question about the media, but, but mm -hmm. indeed it is parallel. I mean, the, the, the behavior of the media has been really surprising. So pro-government almost all over the world. No real check of facts, not really especially questioning or assaulting the politicians. It has been extremely cooperative. And this is a trend, is a trend over the last 20 years. Certainly it was not so during the Vietnam War, I mean. Not from the right and not from the left. Now, now journalists, it seems just to, to only to expect to become politicians on their own side. <laughs> So I'd say, and so they are uh, concocting with, with the politicians themselves what to say, and they are extremely pro government. And maybe, maybe, maybe they were expecting funds or, 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 or to be reimbursed of, of their losses. I do not know, but certainly there was no particular role of the media played except for the spreading of fear. The spreading of fear has been very, very effective. Thank you. Uh, as we are a bit overdue, I think if if nobody has any questions, uh, we we should be going towards the closure of the of this webinar. Uh, Christina, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, nothing too much to add on my side. Again, thank you, Professor Monetary, for a very uh, interesting lecture. Um, I think your ability to cover such a, a wide gap of historical um, uh, connections is really interesting. And I think um, I was reminded again of that previous lecture that you gave and how you ended on the city. And um, when you showed that image um, and connecting the city then and now to lockdown, I think also opened my eyes to a fresh way of viewing things that we've seen so many times. Um, and I think this is sort of a, a very important um, contribution that you bring, bring fresh eyes to things that we uh, thought we knew, <laughs> um, in which the state of exception has changed and continues to change uh, has been very fascinating for me. Um, so thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, everyone, for your engagement. Um, I think other than that, I won't add anything more. We are over time and we want to respect everyone's time. Um, so I'll just hand over to Anya for any closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you so uh, much. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I, I did see Katrina's hand for a while. Uh, did you have a, any last remarks or? Okay, no. Uh, I, 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 think, I think this webinar was very useful because it gave us a lot of like thinking points and I, I will be th thinking about it a lot. Uh, I, I definitely did see a lot of uh, throughout the COVID pandemic uh, and the very like the many subsequent ha happenings from the COVID past to, you know, uh, within previous week, I was able to participate in three events. So one was the protest for ecological happenings. Then the second one was the, the, the pride parade. And the third one was the anti-globalist protest against the COVID past. And I, I, I've noticed precisely these same things we've been mentioning, the, the same type of narratives. And the very, you know, as you mentioned, the, the Schmittian very, you know, friend or foe. So you have a very clearly delineated who is the friend and who is the foe. So I think this, this webinar was very useful, I, I think, for all of us in how we will continue to, to see what ha happens around us. So I, I'm seeing that Wilson has raised his hand. So Wilson, do you have any like closing remarks before we finish? Hello, everybody. Yes, please. I just wanted to say something really quickly. Um, it was really an insightful discourse. 
Thank you, Professor. I was just gonna ask if this wouldn't strain or stretch your, your, your time considerations about the theoretical framework for the, the state of exception, because as we have it now in the postmodern approach, you know, simplified into a state of emergency where we have a situation that limits rights in the, in the public's interest. So in your kind opinion, do you think there is a way that this theoretical framework can be improved upon? Mm. Well, the, the, yours is the, the most intriguing and difficult question of all, and, and indeed it is what I'm, I started from, saying that now I presume that the paradigm followed by Foucault and Dungamben is worn out. It is worn out just because it was a paradigm on exceptionality and it's becoming normal. So when people normally speak about what is exceptional and then we have to accept for the sake of the, for the, sake of the nation, the sake of the state, certain measures, it is losing all, 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 all its appeal. And I, I really do not know how to do, how to cope with this situation. Because uh, it is like, uh, this is very capitalistic in a way, the capitalist anxiety of constantly changing forms. I mean, the forms of art, the forms of, uh, of everything, of, of commodities and so forth. And also academic discourse. This academic discourse cannot last for more than five years. After all, it, it, it is consumed, used. And the same happened for the postmodern theory itself. I mean, uh, Lyotard just lasted for five years. It is a fashion. There are ways and ways and now there, were, there, is, there was the way of a state of exception, how intriguing is it, um, so many translations and so forth. And now it, it is almost uh, useless exactly when the state of exception is occurring at a global level. Maybe it, it was a way of consuming radical criticism. It is possible. But I'm not so conspirationist as to imagine something like that. It is simply capitalism does consume forms continuously, including academic forms. That is the instability, the, the instability, we must have conscious the instability of what we say or of our frames and categories. Thank you. Uh, I think we should definitely uh, close the session now and th thank you. Professor, for a very useful and very interesting lecture, and and thank all of you for a very lively and vibrant discussion. I really enjoyed it, and I really hope to see you on our some of our next web webinars. And uh, thank you. <laughs> That's it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you all. Take care. We'll All see right. You. Take bye. care. Bye. 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 Very good. No, thank you so much. Um, always fantastic and uh, always a pleasure. Oh, and oh, to be thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> Great. Um, we'll send the, the link for the YouTube. Um, all right. All right. All right. All right. And then we, we should keep in contact uh, again. Okay. Yes, for sure. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Bye.